Thank you very much, Stitch. And I'll speak in a really big voice. Let me know if you can't hear down the back there. Um, I wanted to uh, really start by saying uh, thank you to, to Susan and uh, the Murrumbidgee LHD uh, and to Gail and to the LHAC for an invitation to speak here this evening. It's a real pleasure and thank you for that invitation. It's nice to see so many friendly faces, a number of you I've met before, but not all of you. So this is a good opportunity to, to meet more of you and hear about the things that you're doing. I'm in a very, yeah, sure. I'm in a very hard place because I'm between you and your food. <laughs> I'm even in a harder place because I'm between the drinks and the food. <laughs> so we'll try and keep it punchy. Um, I wanted to really start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and uh, also to acknowledge uh, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I also wanted to start with an acknowledgement of what good care we have in New South Wales and I think that's really important for us to do. Um, and what we're here talking about tonight is just some of the ways that we can make it that bit better. And that's what I'd really like to focus on. And in doing that, I think it's very important that we hear the voice of our patients and if I can't get this to work, oh. no, 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 it's all right, it's all good. I've turned it on now. Look in the technology. Um, I wanted just to tell you Mary's uh, story very briefly. Mary came and spoke to me uh, a couple of years ago after spending a week in a facility in New South Wales. And at the end of that hour of telling me her story, I said, can you just summarise for me what was that experience like? And she said, look, Karen, I couldn't have faulted the technical care. The technical care was excellent, but I felt like a lump of clay. And at the end of that period, people had come and gone into my room. They had not introduced themselves. They'd come and they'd done things to me. They didn't tell me what it was they were doing. And that is my lasting memory of that care. And I think that's important that we listen beyond the numbers to some of the stories and the things that people have to tell us. And that's really led us to be thinking about a model that we refer to as patient-based care, and you'll hear me use that term, where the patients and the families and the carers are an equal part of the model. And the staff are the other part, which is absolutely critical. And those relationships, the way in which we listen to our patients and our families and we respond is one of the key things I want to talk about. And the fact that every patient comes encased in a set of community expectations. And I know, um, I've heard from Stetson earlier today, you were tapping into some of those and listening to the feedback from the survey around what your community is saying about care and the sorts of things that, that people want to see done here within your LHD. I'm very keen to see us move in terms of the way that we engage with patients and families and carers from where I think we are at the moment, at the bottom of this model, which is around informing. We've still got quite a didactic sort of model, but really needing to move through to partnership and empowerment and full engagement, which is at the top end of this model, thinking quite differently about the way in which we deliver healthcare. And when we consider quality and what makes up quality in care, I think within the system, we can often get really stuck on the technical care. The things that Mary was talking about, that actually we often do fairly well. But we aren't focusing enough on the relationships and on the environment, and the way in which we deliver that care. And the organisations I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learnt about places across the world that have really made a difference and when they start to work, thank you. Hello, does that? Oh. I'm here. Oh. I am. <laughs> when, when these organisations start to, to really focus on, 
on the patient in terms of the way in which they deliver care and redesign care. <coughs> they notice that also they improve in terms of the clinical quality as well. So this is something that happens in partnership. And we see that those organisations don't only improve the overall experience of their care of the patients, but they improve a whole range of clinical outcomes as well. And that's really critical. And there's a business case for doing this. And this is where we tend to get the attention of the chief executives and general managers. It's important that the business case is pushed because when we have a more a greater focus on the patients in terms of healthcare delivery, we see less um, legal claims, we see less incidents, we see happier staff, staff that are really engaged in their work environment and don't move on. They stay where they're enjoying their jobs. So we can't really ignore this area as subjective. And I do hear quite frequently, oh, well, you know, that came through in the patient survey, but it's, you know, it's a bit soft. It's not really the hard stuff. We can't ignore that information any longer. Um, this is based on a, a study I did in America looking at a whole range of different organisations that were really patient focused. And at the end of that period, these are the kinds of things that were identified as being the characteristics of those organisations. And one of the things that they did extremely well was engage with patients, families and carers in the way in which you've been doing here today and right throughout the organisation, often in an integrated way. We've taken some of those learnings and issued a challenge to all of New South Wales. And I'm very pleased to say that your LHD is signed up to this challenge. It's a long-term strategic plan. So if you look at some of the strategies within this challenge, you'll see the kinds of things that make a difference in leading organisations. That commitment from your leadership, having that uh, real ownership from the board, from people like Gail, having Susan completely committed to what you're doing and getting out there to the services, making sure that you're in touch with what is happening. And we know that when this doesn't happen, we see the kinds of incidents uh, and um, the kinds of things that have happened in places like Mid Staffordshire in the UK. A number of you might have heard about some of the incidents there. And when they looked closely, they found that the, putting the patients first was not what they were doing, was not what they were on about. So there are some key lessons for us. And we know clearly what it is that's important in care. And we've seen this again and again. What are we doing about making this central to the way in which we deliver healthcare? I wanted to just uh, share with you a little bit of data from some work done in America. They have one patient survey throughout the whole country, not like here, all our states do different things. <laughs> but what was interesting at looking at this big data set was that we were able to analyse the kinds of things that patients said about the services. And then to think about those responses against a <coughs> matrix which looked at where are the areas you really need to focus on to make a difference. And the kinds of areas that are highlighted up the top here, controlling pain, managing pain well, having staff that are responsive, staff that talk to you about the medications that you're on, those are the kinds of things that will make the biggest difference in terms of the way in which we experience care. All of these things on the grid are important, the way we communicate. But the things in the white box down here, although they're important, reducing noise, making rooms quieter, they're not to patients as important as the things in the red box. But when you have a look at what the services actually do, they focus on the low-hanging fruit. They're the things that we find easiest, and so we focus on things like reducing noise. And the conclusion from this work was that hospital improvement priorities don't match up 
with the things that we really need to be improving and focusing on. Let's think about how we're doing in, in New South Wales. This is some information about the patient survey that was done a couple of years ago now in, in New South Wales. When you have a look at the green boxes on the right hand side, they're the things that patients think we do really well. And the things reported are on the red side are poor. But what this diagram looks at is what drives those experiences. And interestingly enough, it's the same things at either end of the scale. Do you notice that the staff are working together as a team? Is the communication good? Is there respect and dignity? So those things drive both a good and a poor experience of care. And the thing that's really hard in all of this is to change minds, is to shift hearts, is to get people to move from what we've traditionally done in healthcare, which is often very focused around the provider of the healthcare rather than the recipient of the healthcare. How do we change those attitudes? And I think they are shifting. This is some of our own information from the Clinical Excellence Commission. And just in the three years that I've been working at CEC, we've seen some of that cultural shift. And this is a question that we ask every year of staff in New South Wales about how do they view family and patients? Do they view them as an integral member of the healthcare team? And we can see that that's slowly shifting. Some of the drivers, the accreditation standards that are now being used with all of our services are bringing attention to this area. Standard two, which a number of you will be familiar with, is around partnering with consumers. So that's one of the, the drivers. But yet when you ask the services, this is a survey of three, three and a half thousand uh, health service executives and hospitals across Australia, what are they struggling with? The blue bar, partnering with consumers. They're finding that difficult. I want to just share some exemplar uh, cases with you. Um, this one from the US Medical College of Georgia. This is an organisation that uh, for 10, 15 years has been working with patients and families to really deliver excellent care. And they've been doing that in many different ways. They've seen huge cuts in their lengths of stay. They've seen massive shifts in the um, retention of staff. And they have about 350 people on a waiting list wanting to work with them. That's the kind of environment that they are. And this is what their chief executive said to me. <coughs> success feeds on success. The staff are happier. Our market share goes up. They're a private facility. Uh, mortality decrease, preventable harm. It's a win-win in, in his terms. And here's what happened to their medico-legal claims. They really started their work intensely around a patient focus in 1997 and dropped right off, irrespective of increasing caseload. I believe you saw the empathy clip a bit earlier today. I hope you had the tissue box <laughs> close by. I've seen it so many times, I can't remember now. It affects me every time. Um, I wanted just to share a little story about some of the background. Um, while I was in the US, um, Cleveland Clinic was one of my study sites in the study that I mentioned a minute ago. And I had the pleasure of me meeting the chief executive, Toby Cosgrove. That empathy clip is entirely because of an experience that happened to Toby Cosgrove. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, he's one of the leading surgeons in the US. He was invited by the Harvard Business School to come and do a presentation in Boston. He rocks up, he does his presentation, all the you know, deans are there, he thinks it's all fantastic. And then right at the end, a student in the front row pipes up and says, Dr. Cosgrove, I have a question for you. Yes? My father needed heart surgery in the last year, but we decided not to come to you at Cleveland Clinic. By this stage, he's reeling. And yes, why, why was that? Because we heard you had no empathy. He said that for him was his aha moment. He had been saving lives, but he hadn't been giving much consideration to the way 
in which he was delivering that care. Mm -hmm. And so he has turned that organisation around in the most amazing way because of the way in which that personally affected him. So what you see as empathy in that clip is the product of that experience of really making him examine what was he doing in healthcare. So here's where they're at now. This is what they're doing. Um, this is uh, John Cotter. Uh, anybody who's worked in change management might know Cotter's eight steps. Um, John Cotter has now shrunken those down to three. See, feel, change. You feel something when you see that empathy clip. You want to make a difference. You're motivated to change. So Cleveland Clinic has taken on board those principles. When I went to visit them in uh, 2009, they just made a huge jump in their patient experience surveys. And I thought, I want to know what that organisation is doing. I want to know what makes them different. Um, and they've kept that up. They've continued to go higher and higher. They're up to 92% now. That's 92% excellent. That's what their patients rate them. Here we are in New South Wales, 34% excellent. So that's the, that's the benchmark. We're doing well, we can do much better. And these are the kinds of things you would hear right throughout Cleveland Clinic. From the moment you get to the front door, you know what the priorities are for that organisation. And these are the sorts of things that they did that made a difference. They were focused on the leadership, making this a strategic priority. Being transparent about their outcomes, having them out there publicly. They did a deep dive into patient experience. Patient surveys, entry level. They give patients journals. They put in mystery shoppers. They sit people in waiting rooms. They want to know exactly what's happening within their facility. And everyone is a caregiver. The janitor spends more time in the patient's room than the neurosurgeon. You need to know what the janitor knows about the environment that they're in. Here's some of the things they've been doing more recently. They're very open, quite electronic. They give patients the ability to schedule their own appointments. Um, they reach out into the community. They make sure that they do a lot of follow-up. Um, they give access to patients to their lab results online imaging, they have a two-way messaging portal for patients who want to ask questions of their healthcare professionals, and patients are allowed to report their own outcomes and record them within the medical record. So I wanted just to finish by telling you about some of the things that we've been working on closer to home at the CEC in our program partnering with patients. And one of them we've been looking at is how do we engage patients and families in being able to escalate their concerns? Let us know when they're really worried, when things are going south, when a loved one is hospitalised. And we've seen so many inquiries over the years, so many coroner's reports, um, and this one's from WA, where family concern was not listened to, was not taken on board, um, and what we're really trying to do is see how can we make sure that uh, those concerns are really taken seriously and taken uh, on board. So we developed a program with consumers called REACH and we've had some very good conversations here in, in Griffith. Um, we've been talking about how you introduce that locally. But essentially it is about giving patients and families the language saying if you're really worried, engage with your staff. If you're still really worried, call for a clinical <coughs> review, request a clinical review. If you're still really worried, <coughs> you can call for an emergency response. And here's how you do that. And the first call that we had made was by Christine on the left. She escalated care for her mother who was uh, in Orange Bates Hospital. And um, the outcomes of that were, were really amazing. I won't tell you the full story, uh, but essentially the kinds of things that staff are saying um, that we've seen across the state are initially we were really concerned about this, now we think it's just core business. This is just how we, we do things around here. 
And absolutely what we're seeing from our data is that these calls lead to a change in treatment plan. They've averted calls, uh, averted patient transfers to ICU, and we really want to get people early in the piece when uh, they're deteriorating so that we can actually do something about it. And it aligns with the national standards, so it's a win-win for the organisations as well. And, and I know that you're having a, a, some conversation around this tomorrow. I think Meredith's going to be speaking on REACH, so she'll tell you about some of the things you're doing <coughs> locally. I wanted also to mention Top 5, which has had a big presence within uh, this LHD. Um, we have uh, had a, just a marvellous two years working on, on Top 5 and working with people within your services. Uh, this is a program which is designed to promote uh, the knowledge that carers know, particularly about loved ones um, with dementia or other cognitive impairment, using that information um, to uh, record, have it recorded and used by staff um, in the way in which they care for patients. And we've seen a big difference um, in, in what this has meant. And some of the stories that have come through from Top 5 have just been absolutely amazing. This was one of them uh, about a uh, gentleman who used to be the editor of a, a local newspaper. He was very agitated um, if he didn't receive that newspaper, but it wasn't until that was really discussed with the carers and written down and passed between staff they worked out that they no longer needed intensive 24-7 uh, staffing, or specials as we call them, um, because that patient was now uh, much more uh, at ease. Similarly, another example, a gentleman who used to put his car in the garage at 4 o'clock every day will alternatively go fishing. Once the staff were aware of that through top five, they knew if they just said to Bob, cars in the garage, well, you caught a really big fish today, he was completely happy and much less agitated, wandered less. Not only has this improved people's experience, now, I shouldn't be showing you this because you might not be able to leave the room afterwards because we haven't released any of this data, but we've seen in sites that had falls at the beginning of using top five, we've seen a 36% drop in the falls rate, which is huge. Uh, and this was irrespective of the season um, and uh, irrespective of there being other falls orientated strategies within the facilities. So we haven't released this public yet. You've heard it first. Don't tell anybody. Um, and we'll, we're waiting for the funder HCF uh, to accept our report formally. I wanted just to end by sharing uh, with you uh, some um, lessons from uh, Kodak. Who knows who developed digital photography? Anybody? Has it a guess? It was Kodak. Kodak decided not to invest in digital photography because it was going to ruin their film and camera business. Oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think there are some lessons that we can learn from, from other industries. Um, this was, a, a, I think, a very insightful comment. Um, you know, we think in the areas that we work, that we're in the healthcare business, but a bit like Kodak, perhaps we could be missing some of the, <coughs> the signs because really we're in the health business. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. And I'll leave that thought with you, and I hope you enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Thank you.